Okay. So in this video, we are just going to try to review all the stuff we've seen recently. Okay. So I'm going to begin by going over the definition of group, not as a definition, but just like uh, re recalling what are the three things happening in group. What are the three conditions for a group? Yeah. Just the names. Hmm? Associative hmm? identity and universe. Inverses, right? And we've seen that these things individually they don't look very powerful, but when you put them together, they just give you stuff that's really great, right? So groups really are sort of you can think of them as as arising with the interaction of these three conditions, which together give pretty strong restrictions. Okay. We've seen various things. I just had associativity, things where you just had identity and so and they weren't that interesting, right? You got a few results, but not much. But with groups, when you have all of these, it just works. Okay. Uh, a little while ago, we actually saw why that happens. It's because, it's because these model symmetries, right? Functions and transformations. Associativity is because function composition is associative. Identity because the identity map should be a symmetry. And inverse because we want things which are invertible. But, in more recent times, we've been concentrating on on how these interplay with each other in a purely formal sense, where you want to cancel things and things like that. Okay, and either way, whether you look at it formally or as symmetries, you'll see that that this is a pretty powerful combination of axioms. Okay, good. Okay, now let's recall the proofs of some of the things we saw. So, uniqueness of identity elements in a group. Well, we actually show that identity element is unique for any binary operation. How do we do that? We actually showed if you have a left neutral or a left identity and a right identity, they have to be equal. How did we do that? Multiply. Multiply them, right? So E1 is left identity, or I'll, I'll call it left neutral. We just rapid reviewing the proofs. Right neutral. Then E1 star E2 is both equal to E2 because E1 is left neutral and it's equal to E1 because E2 is right neutral, so E1 equals E2. Okay, good. So that's actually true in, in general. You don't need to need, need the associativity and the inverses for that. But it relates to in groups. Okay, uniqueness of inverses. And this actually required associativity. Right? How did we do this? So you have identity E. So E is the identity. Let's say now you have a two-sided identity. And A has left inverse B and right inverse C. And what I wanted to show is that the left and right inverse are equal. How do we do that? What did we consider? Use associativity eventually. B, right? A, C. Yeah, so we consider B star A star C. Okay. And parenthesize it like this. And this becomes E star C, which is C. So B is the left inverse, right? And this is also equal to B star A star C, which is B star E, which is B, because it's a right neutral. Okay, so, so that's why the, the, so the left inverse equals the right inverse, right? So, so through this chain of reasoning, we got left and right inverses are equal, but if any left inverse equals any right inverse, that means that the two-sided inverse is unique. And moreover, you can just compute it as a left inverse. If you know right inverse also exists, then it has to be equal, right? So we not only show two sided inverse are unique, we show that uh, any left inverse equals any right inverse. So a little stronger. Okay. How did we show that any invertible element is cancellative? Or rather, we showed if an element has a left inverse, it's left cancellative. And if the element has a right inverse, it's right cancellative. How do we show that? So, so let's say A has left inverse B and I want to show A star C equals A star D. And again, these most of the truths work in slightly more generality than groups, right? But in groups, they sort of always apply and the other things you make assumptions. So if A has a left inverse B, why can you conclude this? Why can you cancel it on the left? Uh, times A inverse. On both or, sides. Which is just the left inverse right now. So we mm -hmm. left multiply. So this is what we want to show. So left multiply by B. 
yeah, if you're in a group, you could just call it a in verbs. Right now, we are just recalling the groups, which are in slightly more general settings. Now, what do you use? Well, yeah, so this is in, in associate, I, I guess I didn't write it here, but we did say it when we did the full thing, but this is uh, user associated. And so does the previous one. Okay, yeah. So now what do you do? Associate UT. So you get Okay. Now uh, let the uh, identity is E. So this is E star C equals E star D. So C equals D. Okay. These are just quick recalls of the proofs. So, so that's how you got left invertible implies left cancellator. Similarly, you can prove right invertible implies right cancellator, right? And if it actually is invertible, which means it has a two-sided inverse, so both left and right invertible, then it's cancellated on both sides. And in particular, in groups, since everything's invertible, everything is cancellated, both on the left and on the right. Okay. Uh, the next thing, if if your operation is associative, then you can drop parentheses, not just from products of three things, but from products of any number of things. Why is that? Hmm? Because... Well, we didn't actually give the proof, but you can just yeah. do it in multiple steps, right? You just keep moving the parentheses around. Yeah. So you can just use associativity of th three things, which is how associativity is usually written, to show that whenever you have a product of n things, so whenever you have any product like... Whatever way you parenthesize them, as long as you keep the same order, whatever way you put the parentheses, the answer is the same, right? And though, and it follows just from the associative law for three things because you can just use the associative law three at a time and keep moving the parentheses around to convert from any parenthesization to any other. And that's the reason why we often just write this product as a string, right? Since we don't have to worry about the parenthesization, we can also sort of forget about the star. And that's why in groups, we generally just write them as strings. We don't put any star. We just write them one after the other. Okay. That's part of the reason. Some people even omit the star for non-associative operations. But we don't do that here. Okay. Uh, inverse map is involutive. What did this say? Well, it said two things. So it said that when you are trying to invert a product, so for two things, for a product of two, it would say this. For a product of n things, it would say this. And there's another law, another part of the involutive thing, which is this law. So why why is this true? Why is this reversal law true? Well, you just multiply this by this and you check that you get the identity. Mm -hmm. Right? And and what happens when you try to multiply? you keep cancelling a thing and it's inverse, which appear next to each other, mm -hmm. right? And you keep doing that and you eventually get to the identity. This thing, the inverse of the inverse of the origin thing, that just follows from the definition, because inverse means their product both with the identity, right? Mm -hmm. So this is fine. Now, using finiteness, well, we've not used finiteness for many of our things, also, but it's still, we used, we, we proved one small fact for a finite group, which doesn't work in infinite groups. So what is that? Something about the subset being closed under multiplication. Uh -huh. What if did we? If and B is in a subset of G and B inverse A is in, is in also in a subset. No, that that actually was was true for all groups. It was the one with just products without inverses, which is true only for finite things. Okay. So finite thing. The what the statement was that any so so you have finite group G. And you have a non-empty subset H, which is closed under multiplication. Yeah, H is inside. Yeah. And how do we use finiteness? Can you quickly recall the idea of the proof? Uh, the repetition. Well, explain that a bit more for those who aren't included. So H is non-empty, so you can so so you can pick an element in H, right? That that's sort of the, the idea. But like if you pick an element X in H, you look at then what else do you know is in H? Any positive power of X is in H. All positive powers of X are in H. 
since all positive powers of x are in h and there's like there's a sequence of them right for all positive integers that looks like infinitely many of them but a g is finite so h is finite so there must be a repetition. there must be a repetition so you will actually get x is in h then there exists so uh, k l in the naturals with k greater than l such that x to the k equals x to the l which would give you x to the k minus l is the identity and since this is still positive therefore uh, you have that a positive power of x is the identity which means that the identity is an h mm -hmm. then we then we did a little more manipulation just took the one just before this and that gave you that the inverse map is also an h so just being close in the multiplication we were able to show that that it actually is uh, closed under it contains identity and is closed under inverses that's not the only way one uses finiteness. That's the only thing we've seen. Uh, there's another thing which is related, which I think is what you were saying earlier. If you have a group, not necessarily finite, and you have a subset, which is non-empty, and it's closed and taking left quotients or right quotients. So these are just like, like you're trying to divide one thing by the other, but you have to specify whether you do it on the left or the right. So uh, the left quotient, let's try this one. So, so if I want to write A by B, there's two interpretations, right? What are the two interpretations? A, B versus A, mm -hmm. and A, B versus A. That's the left quotient, and that's the right quotient. And the claim was that if you have a subset of a group, which is non-empty, and so group G, non-empty subset H, then H is a subgroup if and only if H is closed under the left quotient. And there wasn't anything deep to the blue, just like a trick. You first show the identity element is in there, then you show inverses are in there, and then you show that. Uh, the multiplication is in there. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, manipulating equations, we actually, there was a long video on manipulating equations. There were actually two videos. One was for the elements part and the other subsets part. Right? And that just sort of, all the things we did here, we sort of thought of them in concrete terms. When you have an equation, you can move stuff to one side. You can multiply on the left by something, multiply on the right by something. You can multiply two equations. You just have to be careful because it's not necessarily commutative. You don't switch the order of terms within a product. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. There's a couple other things we had here. Uh, we use these two to show that there's there's two different definitions of group, and we used to, these to show they're equivalent. One definition just uses just has the group multiplication as part of the structure. The other definition includes these as part of the structure. But since they are unique, those two definitions are the same, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we also proved another small thing. I didn't mention it here. But we also proved that that uh, that you have two definitions of subgroup. One has a, let me just write that down here. Why well, I should fill that in here? So, uh, so the one definition says that the subgroup is just a subset which is closed under group multiplication, and it has an identity and inverses. The other definition said what? What is like the difference between the two definitions? The other definition says that a group is a set with three operations. No, no, that's the definition of group. I'm talking about definition of subgroup. Oh. So one definition said the subgroup has some identity and some inverse of its own. But the other definition said what? It's a subset with close and a multiplication. Yeah. And no, so one definition said it's closed under multiplication and has an identity and inverse of its own. 
the other definition said that the identity and inverse are actually the same as the ones in the big group. Okay. Okay, and we showed that those definitions are equivalent. And for that, we actually use this cancellation thing to show that the identity in the subgroup has to be the same as the one in the group. Okay? Okay. Okay.